Hello and welcome back to English 332. In this lecture, we're covering Chapter 9 of the book, which is sharing informative and positive messages with appropriate technology. Uh, so this lecture, we'll get into questions about the most common type of business communication, which is just sending somebody information. Uh, so you're not trying to persuade them to do something. Uh, you're not, of course, not giving them uh, bad news, obviously, but this is uh, just information they need or maybe some good news. Maybe you're sending a letter uh, to a college student who just received a scholarship. Uh, so something along those lines, or maybe you're opening up a new product line. And we'll also get into when's the best time to use uh, email? When should you text? Uh, when is a face-to-face -face meeting? appropriate. So there's a lot to cover here. I think you'll really uh, get a lot out of this chapter and it's of course uh, very very important information. Uh, so without further ado then let's get into it. And here are the learning objectives for the chapter. We'll be talking about the purpose of these kinds of messages, what kinds of communication hardware you might expect to see in a modern office, uh, what kind of business media uh, you could be expected to use and how to use them well or effectively, how to organize the information, what to put in the introduction, conclusions, and so on. And then we'll look at some of the common varieties of these kinds of messages. So things like a thank you notes, positive feedback, a positive response to a complaint, and much, much more. So let's look at the kinds of messages we'll be talking about here. Uh, the first type, and probably the most common type, is just the, an informative message. You don't expect, you expect a, a neutral reaction on the part of the receiver, meaning it's, they're not going to be angry about it or happy about it. <laughs> it's just the stuff they need to know. A sort of, I think the example in the book was you get a, you're working in a pharmacy and you've got a, you're giving people these uh, medications, right? And they, part of that is a set of instructions about how often should you take the pills, how many pills and, and so on. So that kind of information, it's just informative. You know, I guess some, somebody could get upset about the uh, <laughs> number of pills they have to take maybe, but <laughs> uh, they probably just read that and uh, just to figure it, they, what they, how many pills do I need to take, right? <laughs> it's just, uh, I need that information. I don't expect it to be, uh, to be jumping up and down about it or, uh, or crying about it, just neutral. Uh, the next part is, or the next uh, kind rather, is the positive message. And this is where you do expect a, an emotional reaction, but fortunately, <laughs> it's good. Uh, so maybe you're sending a, a student, if you work in the at St. Cloud State, maybe uh, you're sending students uh, notifications that they, uh, their applications have been approved, right? Or they're accepted into college, or they're, they're getting a scholarship, uh, or <laughs> their grade is, uh, is good, right? So anything like that, would fit into this second category. And neither one of these messages will be asking the receiver to do anything. So they're, they're both informative in the sense that they're giving you information. Uh, they're not persuasive. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that later, this, uh, the idea of trying to um, persuade somebody to do something. Here we're just letting, the, letting them know something. All right, so what are the primary purposes of these kinds of messages? Uh, to give information or good news to the audience. And then also uh, to have the viewer receive this information positively. And we'll get a little bit more into this idea about uh, receiving it in a positive fashion. Uh, we'll, we'll get into it here, I guess. Uh, so what, what do we mean by that? It's uh, to build a good image of the sender. So even if you're sending simple information like that, you know, take two pills on three three days a week or whatever. Uh, part of the way, what do you want to be thinking about in addition to just the information you're getting across is, um, am I, the way that I've worded this, the way I'm presenting this information, does it, does it make the company look good? Um, and that could cover everything from typos, does it have a spelling error, is it hard to see, um, is it a friendly tone? Is it using that you-centered, you-centeredness we've been talking about off and on uh, throughout this semester? Uh, that's part of it. Uh, the good image of that, uh, the well, I guess the first one was just the you, I guess, the person writing the message. Uh, the other part is not just that person, but that entire organization. So in a sense, even if you're on the phone uh, taking calls, 
at that pharmacy, right? Somebody, if let's, if you do a really good job, they'll think, well, this whoever it is I'm talking to, this particular tech, uh, I like this person, uh, but that'll also rub off on the on their, the impression of the entire company, right, or, or their store. They might uh, come to uh, like that store better just because of that one person. And that brings us to this last uh, point here, building that good relationship between the sender and the receiver. A lot of, sometimes a business communication is just a one-off thing. You only have one, you know, one communication with somebody. Uh, but more often, it's going to be a lot more than that. And, <laughs> you know, the more goodwill you have in this relationship, the easier this will be. It's really hard to communicate with people uh, when you don't have, when you have a bad relationship with them or when they're really frustrated with you or the company. And so that's really what all this is about, trying to avoid that situation. Uh, and then uh, going along with that, de-emphasizing negative elements. Uh, so maybe there's a, a catch uh, to some good news, right? Uh, but we want to figure out ways to minimize that and not let it uh, trump uh, the good news we're trying to get across. And then another purpose here is to eliminate future messages on the same subject. So again, sometimes if you get, coming back to our pharmacy example, if the instructions on that on that jar of pills are, are vague, oh, well, the person uh, will have questions, right? And they'll have to call you and, and ask, what, what does this mean? And that could go back and forth. And you don't want that. That, again, wastes company time. It's, it's a waste of, uh, of your time. Uh, so the more we can do to eliminate uh, the need for that, the better. All right, so let's get into my favorite topic here. I love talking about communication hardware. I'm kind of a computer nerd, I guess, a tech geek, whatever you want to, want to call me, but I love this stuff. Uh, tools, digital stuff that will help you improve the, in, uh, the productivity in your workplace. And of course, one of the big things now is the uh, smartphone. Uh, you probably heard a lot about those in the, uh, in the last uh, political campaign, right? So there's kind of a downside to these sometimes. There's privacy issues and ethical issues associated with this. But uh, So you might say, whoa, well, I'm re really familiar with smartphones. I, I love my smartphone. Well, that's great. But the, the point I'm making is in the, in the workplace, you might have to think about that smartphone in a different way, uh, that you might have a special company phone, and you have different set of issues uh, that go with that. But you probably will use it quite often. Uh, portable media players, uh, I'm not sure really what that's <laughs> doing on this <laughs> on this list. This, this book, this part must have come out before the smartphones got to the point where they could uh, do this as well. Uh, but I guess you might have a, you know, I just, I just don't see that one. <laughs> it's going to cross that one out. <laughs> uh, yes, tablets, I think you will see. And of course, uh, if you're not familiar with those, go to the, there's a, a little computer store on campus in the in Miller Center. You can see some of these in action. Basically, they're big smartphones, kind of a halfway between a laptop and a smartphone. And depending on what type of job you have, it's, it's a pretty good possibility you will be assigned a tablet. Because the, uh, the nice thing about a tablet versus a phone is, again, that size. You can show people stuff. You have a bigger screen there for reading at a distance, so you could set it down on a desk, maybe if you're working, and still be able to make out what's on the screen. Uh, but they're also portable enough just to tow it around. So if you don't have one, they're not really expensive. And then the video conferences, we talked about this uh, last time. But uh, again, a lot of companies, they just don't want to pay for travel and pay... Uh, you know, somebody airfare and, and the time and all this to go to San Francisco or New York or much less <laughs> Japan or uh, Bangalore. Uh, think of the costs and when you could just use a Skype a video conference and achieve much of the same goal. So this is just going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, information overload. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the book says uh, the average corporate worker sends and receives 110 emails per day. I mean, try to wrap your head around that, 110 emails. I don't know if I've ever, I guess I probably receive about that many. <laughs> I try not to send, uh, I don't think I've ever sent that many in a day, but 
you never know if you have to respond to a big group of people uh, you might end up sending that many of course it does lead to information overload right I, sometimes students get frustrated with me uh, they'll send an email and they'll, they'll they'll assume i guess that that's the only email i get that day and i can i don't have anything else going on so i can instantly respond to it uh, but the truth is that might be one of like uh, 50 emails in there and some coming from different committees i'm on some from uh, the supervisors basically uh, some might be from uh, former students or colleagues I mean you just it can get easily get lost in in the midst of all this stuff not not even bringing in the junk mail now we do have systems uh, in place to try to uh, limit the spam spam is just uh, basically just email you, you don't want <laughs> you just keep it just gets sent to you um, you don't ask for it right they just keep dumping it on you that that sort of thing uh, so we do have filters in place to keep some of this some of this out uh, nevertheless a lot of it still gets through uh, so again important information can get lost in the midst of this overload and then even the routine communications can become overwhelming uh, especially with the smartphones now uh, people say well you got the smartphone i can reach you at 24 7. Right, but maybe you don't want to be reached 24/7. Maybe you're like, oh, it's you know, it's Friday, uh, Friday evening. It's Saturday. It's Sunday. I don't want to be dealing with uh, business, you know, with the work-related stuff. Uh, so you could get, um, you'd be like I do. I just don't check email on on Sunday. Uh, but you might come back and there's so much stuff in there uh, that it has accumulated that again you might spend half you know uh, half monday <laughs> just trying to get back on top of it right what is this a warning protect your communication <laughs> reputation <laughs> uh, so they're talking there about uh, things like not forwarding that spam or not falling i guess for the uh, nigerian email scam or uh, replying all uh, when you should just reply to the person now, i have some friends that are really guilty of this on Facebook, I don't know if you've uh, played around with this, but there's a there's a messenger tool on Facebook, and you can just use it to talk to one person at a time, which I guess is the default. Uh, but you can also invite other people into that and sort of have a group, uh, a group messaging forum, I guess you'd call it. And I have a lot of friends that are guilty of this, right? They will just start, uh, you know, they'll have a giant list and they'll send this message out to everybody. You know, maybe 50 people and they all get sort of swept up into this um, conversation and most of the time it's just something you really don't care about uh, somebody just promoting a cause or something that yeah maybe it's a good cause and everything but you really don't want that cluttering up your your facebook and especially when it keeps notifying you know, ding 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 <laughs> i think i hit the jackpot uh no it's, it's one of these uh, annoying uh, facebook group things uh, so usually if uh, somebody does that two or three times then you just say well i'm just going to go ahead and <laughs> unfriend this person it's not personal i just don't want all this all this dinging all the time so that's the sort of thing they're talking about in that previous slide about protecting your uh, communication reputation not doing that kind of annoying stuff uh, that might get you taken off uh, somebody's friends list or linkedin account or, or whatever it is and don't pester people all right let's get into this uh, topic here this is um, the question of when is it best to use a to just go meet somebody see them face to face versus talk to them on the phone versus email uh, and a lot of people these days i find they, they prefer the, uh, the text and so they want to do everything over text uh, but sometimes though you really do need to uh, call or <laughs> <laughs> even the dreaded office visit right uh, so let's get into this uh, when <laughs> would you want to have that face-to-face -face contact and they give some examples visiting a colleague uh, that's certainly a good way to build that goodwill right you want to have uh, colleagues on a friendly basis uh, so sometimes uh, when i come into my office it's a hallway there and i've got my colleagues on the on both sides and i pass them by and you know, I try to make a point of at least once or twice a week to kind of have a little stop and chat uh, with the colleagues. I'm not talking about a big drawn out conversation here. Just a hi, how you doing? <laughs> What's going on? How's your how's your dog or how's your house? You know, whatever. 
Uh, just kind of building on that rapport, and you could imagine this would be even more important in a, in a business uh, relationship, right? Uh, same principle, though. Um, so if you've got clients you're working with, if they can come and see you and <laughs> shake hands, I guess, and smile, uh, that can go a long ways towards building that business relationship. People won't just easily switch to a different company uh, just because that, that other company might be cheaper, right? But if they know you, they like you, uh, they probably will still stick with you if you have that relationship. So that's a, a really good face-to-face um, -face contact, a reason to use that. Uh, saving multiple calls or emails, uh, again, uh, sometimes just having everybody in the same room. We talked about this a little bit last time with the or a couple lectures ago about the teams, right? And, and sometimes just being able to get everybody on a conference call uh, or a face-to-face -face meeting, you can get through stuff a lot faster than the sending emails back and forth or texting everybody. Uh, dialogues and negotiation. Uh, again, sometimes this can get into back and forth rapidly, and you don't want to have a, a string of 50 emails when you could just have met with them. Uh, acquiring something immediately. You know, if it's something urgent, you know, sometimes I have a student advise uh, somebody. I'm, I'm a student advisor or faculty advisor, and sometimes students will come in and they'll have a question about their schedule or a class they're supposed to take, and uh, or a form they need to fill out. And I don't, you know, it's always changing, and sometimes I just don't know. Uh, well, the student needs this information right away, so I'll go to again across the hall, <laughs> you know, find one of my colleagues that I feel like is uh, more of an expert. And just ask them the, the question, get the information, come back, uh, bada boom. Uh, this one's kind of interesting, a little sinister maybe. Uh, avoiding <laughs> leaving a paper trail. Uh, so I notice sometimes, and I won't go into details here, but you know somebody's done something maybe inappropriate or there's been some kind of a conflict uh, or somebody's got uh, something they want to say about somebody basically. Gossip, I mean, it's not necessarily gossip, uh, just something they don't want shared. Uh, publicly, uh, they might just come into the office and, <laughs> and shut the door and, and start talking about it. Uh, versus if they put that into an email, see, then uh, there would be some liability there, I guess, if something happens. Somebody might find that email, come back up later. Uh, who knows? Um, let's see what's this last one here. Increase visual and oral uh, cues. All right, there, that makes sense. So, any, when we talked about the body language, nonverbal communication, uh, things like smiling, uh, the tone of your voice. Uh, sometimes you can read an email and think the person is really angry when maybe they were just joking. If they were talking to you, or in there in the room, you could see they were smi they would be smiling and maybe a little wink or something, and you would know it was just a joke. Uh, whereas, again, in that email or text, it might look uh, <laughs> deadly serious. All right, what about the dreaded phone call? <laughs> uh, I don't really like, I hate, I, I hate having to call people personally. I'd much rather just email or text or even go see them. Uh, I just really don't like phones for some reason. Um, just not my thing. Uh, I know other people that love phone calls and they will just call you uh, whenever they, they want. <laughs> it's kind of annoying to me, but I guess that's... Uh, um, their preferred medium, right? You just have to get used to that. Uh, but anyway, there are some advantages. Uh, again, that appropriate tone is a lot easier. We can hear the voice. You can hear, are they being sarcastic? Are they upset? Are they laughing? You can hear all that much better than you can read it sometimes. Again, saving these, mul uh, why does it say save multiple phone calls? <laughs> that doesn't make it. That doesn't really make sense. Use phone calls to save phone calls. Uh, okay, so let's exit out that bit. Uh, the email, though, does make sense. Uh, sometimes, instead of emailing back and forth five or six times, you might just say, you know, enough of this. Let's just call. Let me just let's get this sorted out. Uh, again, the idea of something immediate. Sometimes with the student advisees, again, maybe they need something from the registrar. And instead of walking all the way to the, I'm not going to walk all the way to the registrar's office. I'll just call them. Um, avoiding leaving a paper trail again. So I guess the phone could be tapped <laughs> Who knows these days. <laughs> you know, I've heard that uh, they catch a lot of criminals with the, uh, the cell phones. I guess the, 
or the wireless phones. I guess there's uh, ways to listen in on these, receive them somehow uh, without your knowledge. But uh, again, probably less of a record than if you email or text. Uh, that seems to be more permanent. So if it's something really private and you never want anybody else to ever see it, uh, I would go for the face-to-face -face meeting. And if that's not an option, maybe the, the phone call. All right, and then lastly, the instant messages and the text text messages. Uh, so I guess people still send, well, instant messages, I guess that would include something like Facebook Messenger uh, with the SMS messages on, on your phone, right? Uh, so when are these good? Yes. <laughs> Less intrusive. Uh, so one of the things I hate about, uh, I think one of the reasons I hate the phone calls so much is I'm, I'm usually, I'm a pretty busy guy. You know, I'll be working on something. I'm concentrating on something. And uh, in that phone call, I have to drop what I'm doing, uh, pick up the phone, uh, figure out what that's about. And that, that totally, uh, you know, it'll take me a long time to get back into whatever it was I was working on. So it kind of intrudes, kind of impedes on my productivity a lot more uh, than just a text. If it's just a text, I could glance at it real quick, see if it's important. Uh, if it's not, I could just jump back into my, my work. Um, let's see, ask questions on tasks that fellow colleagues are working on. Um, let's see, well, I wonder what that's what that's about. Asking questions on tasks that fellow... <laughs> uh, I guess if you wanted to have a meeting maybe or see if people are busy. Uh, if they're not, maybe you could get work together on something. And then this one does leave this communication trail, which is a, you know, sometimes a good thing, right? You might want to have, have it on record. Uh, th this conversation you're having, these discussions. Okay, so now we're moving into some media. And this is my favorite one here. I love wikis. So you probably think about a wiki in the terms of uh, something like Wikipedia. Or uh, what's the other one I hear about a lot? The uh, uh, WikiLeaks. <laughs> uh, WikiLeaks uh, used to be a wiki. Uh, it's not anymore. I don't know why they still call it WikiLeaks. Um, but that same software with the wiki, uh, Wikipedia uses, a lot of businesses use that. I think they mentioned IBM in here, uh, maybe Sun. I know a couple of businesses that use them. Sometimes they're open to the public, uh, sometimes they're not. Uh, but the idea is this: it's a website. You know, again, think about Wikipedia. And if, if you don't realize it, you can, there's a little button there called Edit. On Wikipedia and you can click that button and actually go in and change up the text or add something new to the wiki. Uh, so a lot, again a lot of businesses use these for things like um, uh, let's see um, call-in centers this is an example that springs to mind or tech support so maybe you're the tech support uh, a tech support person for a software package or uh, maybe you work maybe you're just answering the phone for a company uh, helping people with problems and uh, you know as you have new problems come up and you you figure out what the solution is you can go to this company wiki and there'll be a place for you to put in that problem and solution right and then you put some keywords on it it's really easy to do and then the next time or somebody else has that problem they can go to the wiki and find the solution really quickly so it's kind of a user the people that are using it build it uh, so there's some other examples, uh, bookmarking, uh, summarizing web pages. So what would be some useful websites for you to go to to help people? You know, maybe you have a, that would be a good use, use of a wiki. Instead of having one person go through the entire uh, list, you know, you could divvy that up. Drafts of working documents. Uh, sometimes you might have five, six, 15, 20 people all working together. Uh, you could use Google Documents for that which is basically a wiki, sort of the same thing, I guess. Uh, one thing they don't mention here that's nice, though, is that um, I don't, I'm pretty sure Google Drive has this too, actually. Uh, but one of the things about a wiki is you can look at the history. So it'll show you all the previous versions and who worked on it. So you might have a later on, maybe you're trying to say, hey, I did a lot on this document. Even though it's collaborative, maybe there's 15 people that worked on it, you can go into this history and see all the stuff you added, and it's it's kind of evidence, right, that you, hey, the person did do a lot of the work. 
And let's see, new entries about workplace practices. We kind of covered that one already. Now, social media, this is the big one, the big hot thing now. I do a lot of searches, try to help students get into jobs, uh, find out about career paths uh, for students, my students, but you know, any St. Cloud State students. And one thing I keep coming across again and again and again is social media. So there's all these companies out there, local companies, big companies, uh, just all over the place. There's huge demand for this. They want people that can use things like uh, Facebook, but probably Twitter is the big one I see all the time. Uh, blogs, maybe. LinkedIn, definitely. I see that a lot. But really, Twitter, I see this one all the time. So a company will say uh, they're w wanting to hire a social media specialist, somebody that can come in there and, and use Facebook and Twitter, maybe, or, and LinkedIn to help them uh, interact with their customers or promote their products, they get the word out about their service, uh, build, help them uh, with that relationship with the clients we talked about uh, so this is one where there's definite demand you know if you're looking for a job if you if you can really bone up on these uh, you'll be in a really good position and there's just huge demand for it and you can see here why uh, that is I mean for one thing you hear about them all the time <laughs> on the news <laughs> that's how they get to be popular but uh, connecting with many users quickly so if you have a Facebook page for I'll say we have one for the English department. Uh, if uh, you can get all the people that are majoring in English or interested in the program to like that page, uh, well, that's a makes it easy for you to uh, make announcements about upcoming uh, events on campus, or maybe the scholarship uh, information. All that stuff can be done quickly, and it's a little bit nicer, I think, than the email. Uh, again, yeah, you could email everybody, but it's just going to get lost in the in the shuffle. Uh, inexpensive it doesn't really cost anything more than the uh, you know companies don't have to pay uh, Twitter uh, to have tweets or pay uh, Facebook to have that Facebook page uh, so that helps and then profiles updates blogs uh, useful links you know businesses a lot of businesses are using these things now the smart ones anyway uh, so they have a Facebook page let's say or a Twitter page and they won't just use those to uh, say things about their own products. So they don't just send advertising over these sites, uh, but they'll have other kinds of stuff, just kind of fun stuff sometimes, memes maybe, uh, just interesting uh, stuff that'll um, make people want to subscribe and start reading and paying attention, commenting on it. And again, that's all about building up that relationship more than it is uh, anything else. Now we come to some that are probably less common in these uh, modern times, but nevertheless uh, important. And this is one of those areas that I like to hammer on uh, because there's so few people, uh, especially of a certain age or under a certain age, that know how to properly format a letter or a memo or how to do these things correctly. And it's really easy to learn this stuff. And so if you just take a few minutes even uh, to figure out how to write a letter properly, uh, you're going to have a valuable skill. So if and when this comes up and you're the one person in the office that knows how to do it, uh, well, you know, that's going to get you a lot of positive attention. You'll start, uh, <laughs> maybe the, the manager will start coming to depend on you when there's uh, a need to write a letter. And that's a good position to be in. All right, so sending messages to people outside the organization. All right, so... Not everybody wants an email. Uh, some people, they, they prefer the uh, the paper letter. So that's one reason. And uh, memos are printed also, but they're for people with inside the organization. So again, we've been hearing about mem memos a lot <laughs> in a political coverage, right? And the, and the reason that the, they come up is, of course, because the memo wasn't supposed to be seen outside that organization. Uh, they, they thought of them as sort of private, basically emails, uh, but nevertheless, they did leave a paper trail. And since they're public officials, they can get these uh, different kinds of uh, what they call it, the uh, sunshine laws, I guess, uh, to get access to these, get these memos released. And then they can see some sometimes some nefarious stuff that was going on. Uh, so I just mentioned that to start cautioning you. 
especially if it's a in printed form, letters and memos, uh, they seem very official and they have a lot more, or they seem to have a lot more power in court, or at least the court of a public, public opinion uh, than an email or text. All right, when to send an email, uh, some, most of this is common sense stuff, routine business activities. Uh, you probably wouldn't send a, a formal letter just to let some, <laughs> you know, student know that you're canceling class. Uh, you wouldn't do that because it's uh, just a routine thing, maybe, and you want to save the, the time and the money. Um, allowing readers to deal with messages at their convenience. Yes, that's another nice plus, kind of like a, a text, right? You send them an email, and then they can check their email when it's convenient for them. It doesn't ding, or their phone doesn't ring, it doesn't distract them. Uh, communicate accurately because you do have the time there to edit it, check over it, make sure it's correct. Uh, provide details for reference. So you can go into more details, I guess, with some links to where you got your information from. And then that uh, paper trail again. And so if it's something you want to preserve, uh, you have the, you can go back through that, your old emails and, and find all this stuff. All right, on to organizing these messages. Uh, so they tell you to start off with the good news or the most important information. So just good business practices, as always, it'll be direct. <clears throat> Don't beat around the bush. There's no reason to, right? You're giving them some good news or something they need to know. And so why would you make them read to the second or third paragraph to get to that information? And so imagine if the person's writing back to you about your cover letter and they say and they want to tell you yeah you we we like your resume we want you to come in for an interview <laughs> they probably mentioned that first and you wouldn't have to read 17 pages to get there <clears throat> and then after you've given that important information you might add the necessary details the background so again with our example of uh, the interview of course the next thing would be well when when should i come in where do i need to go uh, do i need to bring anything and that all needs to be conveyed. Uh, if there's negative points, uh, trying to put a positive uh, spin on these. I remember there is these, these are supposed to be either just neutral or positive. So if there's too much negativity, that would actually come, would be <laughs> it's actually going to become a negative message, and we'll get into that next time. Uh, really explaining the, the benefits it doesn't do anybody any good if they don't understand the benefits. So with the, if there's a change to a healthcare plan or uh, tuition or something, and it's maybe there's a new service, new extension of a service, something, a new branch, uh, that doesn't really do anybody any good unless they realize, uh, well, why should I care about this? Well, here's the benefits. <laughs> maybe this uh, new branch has a, a drive-through, right? And you can just go through the drive-through to get your medications instead of having to go inside and wait in line and all that and get outside in the cold weather. <laughs> and you could explain all that. Uh, and then the ending, again, you want to keep positive or personal or uh, forward-looking. You know, what, what about the future? So you uh, looking forward to seeing you, that sort of thing. All right, so here's an area that Again, I think it's just really, really critical. It's one of those things, again, that so few people know how to do well. Uh, even uh, professionals sometimes drop the uh, drop the ball on this. Uh, but we're talking about the subject line of an email. Uh, so this would be, if you had, if, back in the days of memos, they also had subject lines that would tell you exactly what that memo was about. Well, it's the same thing with the, the email. So the idea... Uh, my ideal is that, well, let's just see what they say, and then I'll tell you about <laughs> my ideal might cover it. Uh, so they say the subject line serves three purposes, uh, aids in the filing and retrieving. Well, that's a, that's a very good point. So you might have some keywords in there so you could find that later. Um, tells readers why they should read it. Yes, this is the one uh, that I always come back to. Uh, so if you just send an email to me and it says, and I, it just the subject line is just help <laughs> or hey or problem, uh, something just really vague, uh, that doesn't really help me. I don't know if this is critical, if this is something I can delay responding to. Uh, I don't know um, who it, 
who it is in the sense of what class they're in. You know, sometimes they don't tell me what the class is or the assignment they're working on, uh, what section they're in. So sometimes this can be uh, resolved in a subject line. But yeah, setting up the framework for the message, uh, basically giving somebody uh, enough information for them to decide whether this needs to be opened immediately, uh, whether it can wait for a while, what does it pertain to, or maybe it doesn't even pertain to me at all. Uh, so I just skip it entirely. All right, so subject, uh, new smoking policy, it says there. So I don't smoke. <laughs> uh, so I probably wouldn't even open this. I, I don't I don't have any, you know, it doesn't pertain to me. I, I don't know why I would even open that. Um, that's a pretty good subject line. Again, this idea of saving time, right? If obviously, a smoker would be would want to open that up and read it. Uh, but for me, it's irrelevant. Uh, specific, differentiate messages from others on the same topic. So I guess with the smoking policy they were talking about in the previous slide, that one said it was a new smoking policy. Uh, maybe another email might be change to the policy or upcoming debate <laughs> on policy <laughs> or uh, be wary of students protesting on campus about the policy. I don't know, just making stuff up. Uh, but you could put all that into the subject line uh, to help people kind of basically help people kind of stay apprised of the situation without even having to read those emails just look at the subjects uh concision is of course very important you don't you don't have a paragraph to put into that subject line it just needs to be short uh, 35 characters that seems a uh, very short i mean what's a what's a tweet like 100 something characters so that's about a i guess it's a little bit more than a quarter of a tweet uh, appropriate for the kind of message uh, must meet uh, situation and the purpose. All right, so some more about the subject lines. Uh, we talked about this one before, but the more specific you can make it, concision is important, keep it short, basically. Uh, catchy. Again, you want the person to open up the email. Right? If it sounds boring, if you can't even get a decent subject line, that might put them off of uh, opening up their, the email. Uh, putting the information, good news in there, always good. You know, um, scholarship is, <laughs> you've received a scholarship. <laughs> yeah, you'd probably open that. Uh, name drop to make connections. So maybe you don't know the person, but somebody just told you about them. This might happen a lot in a sales situation, right? Somebody comes in, talks to the, uh, the clerk uh, about, hey, I'd like to buy a car. Maybe you're not there, though. Uh, so they, uh, when you email the person, you could say, hi, uh, you know, Jim, Jim gave me your name, told me you came by. Uh, make the email sound easy to deal with. <laughs> uh, so the example they give here in the book is two short travel questions. Uh, that sounds nice, right? It's, you know, it's two, it's just two of them. And they're short. Okay, I can do this quickly. Let's see. I need five minutes survey. Uh, create new subject line for replies when the original becomes irrelevant. <laughs> re, 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 re appears. And this is, again, something my, sometimes my colleagues are guilty of. Now you get these emails, and they, they've gone back and forth between and amongst dozens of people, and you got this huge blob of junk just all over it. And maybe there's only two words that are new. <laughs> you got the, why are you sending all this junk? You know, just start a new chain, a new new subject line at that point. Managing the uh, information in messages. You know, how long should you put? How much information do they need? Well, <laughs> what do they need to know? What is like, again? This is why you need to think about your audience. Uh, what do they already know? Uh, what will they need to know? A nice thing about these uh, emails is you don't have to necessarily send the same email to everybody. Right? You could. Uh, split them up, maybe have two or three versions of it uh, for different levels. People that know nothing about the topic, people that are just need the updated information. You know, sometimes what I see uh, from businesses, they'll have links in their email uh, for people that need more information. Uh, considering the purpose of that email, uh, developing a system that lets people know what is new if you send out regular messages. So I suppose with this, they're talking about whether 
you know, maybe you send out the same old um, bulletin, I guess, uh, on a weekly basis, monthly basis. Maybe there's not anything new at all. Uh, or not, maybe you have a little section there at the top that says, what's new? And signal that so people can just read that and ignore all the stuff that they are used to seeing. Although, again, I don't know why you'd be sending out a bunch of stuff, uh, a bunch of old information again and again. Uh, headings, bullets, numbered lists, checklists, and long emails. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> All good stuff. Uh, I always try to think of ways I can just make it into a numbered list. So when I give my students uh, instructions about assignments, I try to, I might write it out in paragraph to begin with, but then I'll go back in and see, can I break this up into some headings? Uh, can I use some bullet points? People like to read little bullets a lot more than they do big, big paragraphs, right? A number list good too, especially if these things need to be done in order. All right, this one's a good point here. So put the most vital information in, into an email, even if you send an attachment. And so what I see sometimes happens, uh, especially if there's a meeting on campus, sometimes the, uh, the, the organization, the committee, whatever, uh, they got kind of a nice Word document where they've basically tried to make it look nice, this invitation. Uh, it's, it's very uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, but in the actual email, they'll just say, uh, see attachment for information about the party or about the, the meeting. Well, then I have to open up that attachment just to be able to find out where is the meeting? What time is the meeting? And that can get really annoying really quickly, especially if you're, maybe I'm just using my phone to check my email and I, maybe I can't download this attachment uh, to see that information. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't hurt to copy, just copy and paste the relevant parts out of that attachment. Just put it into the email. People will appreciate that. And uh, if they want to, of course, they can open up that attachment to read the longer version of it. Uh, check message for accuracy and completeness. That should go without saying. <laughs> yes, remember emails are public documents. I'm sure, you, I don't know if, if you've ever been burned with this before, but I certainly have. You send personal emails to people, friends, and you, you just kind of trust that they're not going to turn around and forward this to people. And, and what, what ends up happening, they forward it to the very people <laughs> that you didn't want to see it. Uh, so again, a good reason just to stick to face-to-face -to -face or phone calls because at least that way you have uh, the and so here we're talking about the benefits to the audience using the uh, audience benefits to your advantage so you can imagine if you got this new policy and you talked about some of these I guess that smoking one might be kind of negative uh, for you or it could be a positive thing if I guess if you don't smoke and you don't want to be around the uh, you know, the cigarette smoke. Uh, so you could uh, use that uh, to shape the audience's attitudes towards that policy, right? Stressing those uh, health benefits. Maybe I'm either ambivalent towards it or even feeling negative about it. Uh, so you could use the, if you stress the benefits though, I might come around uh, to appreciating uh, the need for that policy. Uh, yeah, stressing the benefits presents the audience's motives positively. And in introducing benefits that may not be obvious. Uh, so with this one, some, sometimes these little policy changes can be really esoteric. You think about Facebook, all this, uh, they're always changing their privacy policies. And a lot of the times it's just, you're just like, I don't even, who cares? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to read this. <laughs> it's too confusing. Uh, so maybe though that change might actually be, really be a good thing if I could just understand it. Uh, so if they do a good job communicating this and introducing those benefits to me, then I'll, again, all this other stuff will click into place, right? I'll like the change. Now, when should you omit uh, the benefits? Uh, they say it's in, if you're presenting factual information only, <laughs> you might not want to, uh, to go into it. Uh, I guess this is uh, to avoid sounding like you're trying to sell them something. Uh, people might get suspicious about that, right? Like, I don't want the sales pitch, just give me the facts, right? Uh, if you don't care <laughs> about the attitude, uh, maybe it's neither here nor there. And again, maybe it's just neutral stuff. It's not really going to uh, 
you're not really expecting an emotional reaction to it, so you don't feel the need to soften. The, there's no blow to soften. It's just, right, it's just information, so why bother? Uh, stressing benefits makes the audience uh, seem selfish. Well, that's an interesting one. Uh, what would be an example of that, I wonder? Uh, so maybe the... <laughs> I guess maybe you've got this new tax policy uh, that makes the audience have a bigger tax rebate. It's kind of making stuff up, right? But let's just say, let's just say you got one where the audience, the person getting the letter, they're going to get a a little uh, tax boost, but or they don't have to pay as much taxes. But maybe the other people in their community, the poor people, let's say, uh, they'll they'll take a hit. Uh, so you wouldn't want to emphasize that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to feel like they're greedy or they're, uh, they've got an unfair advantage. They might feel bad about that. Uh, restating them may insult the uh, audience's intelligence. Oh. You know, that's a good one. If I, You might have felt a little insulted if you <laughs> some of these lectures, right? If, <laughs> you're like, who doesn't know that? You know, you're, you're talking to me about the benefits of smartphones. Come on. Um uh, what do you think? I've never used a smartphone before. Uh, that's kind of a silly example, but you can see how that uh, this last one I think could come into play. All right, so let's talk about ending the message. And they say that they, of course, won't all end the same way. So let's look at some of the ways you you could go about ending it. Uh, the first one is the goodwill ending. They say it focuses on bond between the reader and the writer. Uh, so here's the one from the book. And so this is their goodwill ending. Thank you so much for sending those two extra sales tables. They were just what I needed for section four of the report. So you can see there how they got the thank you so much. Uh, you're kind of expressing uh, your appreciation. And something like that can go a long ways, right? Uh, sometimes with your peer reviews, I see people will put at the end of their peer review something like, thank you for... Uh, allowing me to review your essay, I really enjoyed it. Uh, something like that. It's a good, good to build a goodwill. Uh, treats the reader as the individual. <laughs> Nobody likes being uh, treated like a anonymous or just one of many faceless customers, right? You, you want them to uh, to respect you and know who you are. Uh, I like to put students' names into emails when I or colleagues when I'm interacting with somebody. I don't just give the information. I'll put something. Uh, uh, and put their name in there somewhere. Uh, it contains you attitude, positive emphasis, and let's see, omit standard invitations. Uh, so if you have questions, please do not hesitate to call. <laughs> uh, they say you should just omit this, I guess, kind of boilerplate stuff. All right, stories and humor. Uh, what are those good ideas? They say you can use a story to gain attention, place information in context, or connect with emotions. Uh, so you might see this, again, trying to think about positive messages. Uh, maybe you want to talk about this uh, scholarship banquet that you're going to have. <laughs> and the person's been invited to the banquet, they're going to receive a, a scholarship. Uh, so part of that message could be a little story, right, about maybe a previous student that received a scholarship and, and what she ended up going on to do uh, with that scholarship, right? And maybe where she is now could make the situation a little happier even. You, you, have, you got a person character in there basically at that point in your, in your story, so it can be more emotional. Uh, humor, uh, that's, it's always kind of a dangerous thing to be humorous in a professional context because you never really know how people will take things and uh, you can easily get yourself uh, fired even if you, you might think it's a funny joke, but they might not think it's funny at all. Uh, so usually the example, uh, the advice is just not even to, to use it unless you do know the audience very well. Uh, you know for sure there's not going to be any uh, issues with it, and of course it's it's appropriate. Uh, so sometimes uh, humor that might be appropriate in a you know, little hallway chat uh, wouldn't be appropriate in a formal email that you're passing around, right? So just being aware of these contexts is uh, the key. All right, and then lastly, let's look at some different varieties of positive messages. Uh, they're talking here about transmittals. Uh, so you could think about the, uh, <laughs> yeah, they got the fax machine. I don't know if you've ever seen a fax machine even or used one. 
uh, but you might have a 12 page document or resume or whatever that you're faxing. And there, usually there's a sheet that goes on top uh, that just says uh, what the what that attachment is basically. And they do that so people will know whether it's worth printing it out or whether they should just cancel it. So yeah, summarizing the main points, giving the details, I guess you could assume maybe the only thing they see is the transmittal. Uh, what if that's the case? So you want to make sure you got all the important information to them. Uh, summaries. Uh, this will happen a lot in a meeting. Somebody will miss the meeting and they'll say, well, what happened? Uh, can you just summarize the conversation? Uh, basically, just a little description of what happened, right? So identifying the people that were there, uh, what was talked about or the topics, Obviously, the, any decisions that were made on those topics and who does uh, what next, you know, what are the next steps? That was uh, the meetings, I guess, or conversation. Now, the document summary, now this will probably be a little more involved depending on how long the document is. Uh, but what, what's the main point of that document? You want to be up front with that. Uh, any supporting evidence or details that go with that? Uh, evaluating the document if the audience wants uh, such advice. And so this might be a scenario I could imagine in a business uh, where somebody comes to you and says, look, I've got uh, seven, eight, seven or eight of these brochures <laughs> from different companies. Uh, can you just go through? I don't have time to read all of this. You know, can you just go through these and, and summarize, it, <clears throat> summarize it for me? Uh, so again, yeah, you just some. What's the main points? Uh, maybe the vital stuff. Uh, how much does it cost? This one cost versus that one. What's the key um, features? And then the uh, manager might ask you for your opinion. Right? Say, well, what, what do you think? I uh, say so you could put your opinions in there too. Your evaluations. Um, client customer visits. Uh, so this this could get a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really, really important, right? If you, uh, anybody from an attorney to, to salespeople, uh, to, to therapist, you know, any situation where you got people coming in and you need to make summaries of those uh, appointments. Uh, so in some ways it's similar. Uh, putting the main point in the first, um, I'm not sure why they use that symbol there, but that just means paragraph. And so what was the main point that goes in the first paragraph? Uh, and then in the a bigger paragraph, you've named the points, give the details in there to support the conclusions, and then the same stuff we've been talking about with, uh, instead of just big paragraphs, uh, try lists, headings, uh, whatever you can do to, to break that up. And then thank you notes. You know, sometimes I think a good thank you note can make the difference. When I was applying for jobs, uh, professor jobs, and I had a, an interview with a university and I always made a point of sending thank you notes so i actually took the time to <laughs> get, get, get the paper uh, have it up uh, you know written out and send it to them and i think that makes a nice impression right it really shows that you are thankful and you look a lot better than somebody that didn't send anything i guess you could just send an email to thank them uh, but it's nice. People like this. People want to feel appreciated. They want to know that you respect their time and, and so on. Uh, so it makes people willing to help you later. You know, big, big plus. You know, sometimes students come in, they need my help with something. I help them and then I never see them again. Well, that's, <laughs> I guess they save some time and writing a thank you later letter. Uh, but maybe, or thank you email, but who knows what might happen down the road. Maybe they need a recommendation letter at some point. You know, and, and there they've gone. They've never shown any appreciation. Uh, why should I help them out uh, later on? On the other hand, maybe they've been very polite, sent the thank you letter. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'll say, of course, I'll be happy to do that, right? I'm, uh, let's see, maybe short, uh, but must be prompt. So it'd be a little silly. <laughs> You know, right before you ask, start asking the professors for your letters of recommendation, at that point to start sending the thank you letters, <laughs> that would look uh, disingenuous at best. You know, really, you'd want to send that letter uh, soon after uh, the class or whatever it was you needed the help with. 
Yeah, it must be specific to seem sincere. <laughs> it was just a generic thank you letter. It just said nothing but thanks. Uh, well, I might even know, what are you thanking me for? Uh, that, didn't, that just seems kind of like a almost a form letter type thank you. And, you know, instead, you'd want to thank you for blah, blah, blah. Uh, positive responses uh, to complaints. So this would be somebody sent me a complaint. <laughs> I get complaints sometimes, and you know why did I get a a zero on this assignment? I, I did the assignment, and why did I get a zero? And maybe it's just a little oversight. Um, maybe it didn't come through. Whatever. Now let's just say though, it's I, I'm able to find it and rectify it. It's not a big deal. Uh, so let's just say I'm writing back to that student. Uh, so I could mention the rectification in the first sentence. Uh, so I could say the that your grade has been uh, updated <laughs> from a zero to a hundred. <laughs> I put that in the first sentence, right? Uh, don't talk about the decision making process. They probably don't even care, right? Uh, the only thing they care about is uh, that the grade was changed. So why go on about this behind the scenes stuff? <laughs> don't say anything that sounds grudging. Uh, yeah, I guess it could have been a little tedious, I guess, for me to go back in and change that. Um, maybe it took some time, but why would I want to emphasize that? Uh, again, it's just something that doesn't need to be shared. Uh, give reasons for the mistake only if it respects, only if it re reflects uh, responsibly on the company. Uh, so again, it might be maybe. Let's just say it was a some kind of server error, right? Or, or maybe I just didn't, <laughs> kind of in a hurry, uh, I skipped over a name. Uh, uh, who knows? Maybe just an accident. Uh, well, again, if I start dwelling on that, going into detail about it, it might make the person think, well, you know, maybe this, uh, maybe this is a shoddy program, or, or maybe this guy's uh, not very well organized. Maybe he's <laughs> dazed and confused. <laughs> Uh, so really, why why go into it? I don't even need to go into it. Why? Uh, probably the first thing is all that needs to be said here, right? So 